And we are in the book of Genesis, and we are in chapter 2, picking up in verse 4 tonight. So last week, we sort of did a topical study on the Sabbath day rest and what that means and what an important subject that is because it speaks of salvation by faith alone and the grace of God alone. And, uh, you know, we, we know what the definition is now. We have to cease from our labors as God did from his, that saving faith. Well, at the very end of the sixth day, man was made. So the very first day of his life was the day to rest in the finished work of God, just like salvation is. Salvation comes as we rest. So our Jesus said it is finished, and then we rest in his finished work, and that is salvation. That's what Adam and Eve did. They rested in the finished work of God, and they obeyed him in that rest. So Hebrews 4 says, we therefore need to be diligent to enter into that rest. <laughs> we need to really work hard to not work at all. And uh, sort of an oxymoron there, but uh, that is the truth. And they had to rest and just enjoy the finished work of God. And that's what we do in the New Testament for salvation. Well, at the end of chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, let's look at that again. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, so do it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be food. And to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for, God, for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Not just good. So the evening and the morning, the sixth day. So as we had predicted, there is a whole lot more to day one than just let there be light, or he separated the light from the darkness. There was a lot more to the story when God created all the fish. Now, we don't know the rest of that story. Some try to fill it in with uh, evolution. I just reject that to the absolute nth degree to think that somehow God was saying that we come from the animal kingdom. We evolved out of the animal kingdom. And once we evolved after several billion years, then we became a living spirit by evolution. It, it just, it's just dishonoring to God. It's just defaming to this story. And God very specifically, uniquely made man, the finishing touch of his creation. Now, he just gives us a quick overview. He says he made them in a story. He made him in his, his own image, in the plural, which is a great passage to teach the Trinity from, and I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to do that. But when, it, when God says our image, he is simply uh, being specific in, in saying it's plural. It is the Trinity talking amongst itself. You'll find that some things the person of the Trinity uniquely do. Jesus Christ alone died on the cross for our sins. The Father and the Spirit didn't join him in that. But all three persons of the Trinity raised him from the dead. We have that in Acts 1 and tells us the Father raised Jesus from the dead. And Romans 8, it says the Spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead. And John 2, Jesus says, I will raise my own body up after three days, speaking of his 
not the temple of the temple, but the temple of his own body. But, and so in creation, you know, we can read John 1. It sounds like the word Jesus made all things. Well, he's the speaker. He's the one who spoke. We saw in, in chapter, verse 2 there of chapter 1, where the spirit was over the face of the deep. And, uh, and so God, all three persons of the Trinity, and, and so they are, are saying this man is going to be different from all other creatures. He's going to be made in our image. And he says, ultimately, they're going to be male and female. Now, this is, again, God writing things in a way that is very word um, specific and, and very much looking at word economy. People that aren't even Christians, when they just look at the amount of information in the Bible and the few words many stories take, it, it's, it's, there's no other literature like it, just on that basis. How few words are used to create such specific stories, it's unique. And this is exactly what we have here. Now we're going to see here in chapter 2 that God makes Adam and Eve and he says, that, therefore, this is why a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Well, Adam and Eve didn't have a dad yet. They were the only two people on the earth. There were no fathers. There were no mothers. There was no. But again, for him to say, I'm creating a principle that doesn't work in this very second, but it will work as man goes on. It's not God saying, oh, there, there's an error in the Bible. He's saying that Adam and Eve were the first women man and woman ever created, and that they left their parents. How can both be true? It's a contradiction. It's like, you gotta be, you got to be kidding me. Logic is telling you he's setting up a principle that will never apply to Adam and Eve, but it's a principle that will carry on throughout the history of man. Very easy to understand. The same thing happens here with chapter 1 of the creation of man, and then a more detailed account, starting in chapter 2, uh, in verse 4. So now he's going to say, let's, let's go back to day 6. First three verses was day 7, the day of rest. We covered that last week. And now he's saying, okay, let's go back and relook at day 6, because that is the day I'd like to give you a little more information on. Now, I would like more information on all the other five, uh, uh, other five days as well. I mean, I can't wait to get to heaven and see the videos of what it means, God's shape separating the light from the darkness and separating the waters from beneath, the waters above. And, and what in the world is he thinking with all these wild and crazy sea creatures? I cannot look at them enough. You ever done that on YouTube? You start looking at crazy sea creatures and, and like four hours later you're going, ah, I gotta go to bed, but just one more. Because they're, they're just amazing. And many of them, man has never seen until recently. Well, verse 4 now, chapter 2. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God, make a note of that, made the earth and the heavens before any plant of the field was in the earth, before any herb of the field had grown, for the, here it is again, Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a, midst, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God, there it is again, formed man of the dust of the ground and, of, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So, let me give you more detail, he says, on day six. First of all, he uses the word Yahweh for the first time. It, we call it the tetragrammaton because it has no vowels. It's only syllables. If we were to transliterate them from the Hebrew, it would translate Y-H-W-H, transliterate or Y-H-V-H. Now, how do some Bibles end up with the word Jehovah instead of Yah or Yahweh? 
Because remember Christianity at one time, the epicenter was Germany. And the German theologians of the mid-centuries believed that this was a code. So what they did is they transliterated the Hebrew into the German. But don't forget, in the German, the Y has a J sound, like our J, not a Y sound. So when you take the vowels out of Elohim and put them between the Y-H-W-H in German, you get a Jehovah. Now, you'll also notice there's different spellings because they also said maybe it's not the vowels out of Elohim. Maybe we should use the vowels out of Adonai. So instead of having a J-E spelling, you have a J-A spelling in some of them because they're just guessing that maybe it's the vowels out of Elohim or maybe it's the vowels out of Adonai and put them in between the consonants um, and that, that's, that's how we'll enunciate it. And so the Jehovah Witnesses have went with that German enunciation. But the Jews today, which I would think if anybody gets it right, it's them. And it's a Jah sound, a Yah, Yahweh, or Yah, just Yah. And it's the personal name of God. As we work our way through the Bible, he's going to constantly put stuff with that. Like, Yah Tidskanu, I am your righteousness. And in essence, this word Yah is just simply the I am. It's I am who I am. I am your shield. I am your savior. I am your God. I am your almighty. I am your whatever it is. In essence, it can go on infinitely. But when we say, let's look at the God names in the Bible, this is what we're looking at, Yah, and then some other word. And it's fun to look them up. Uh, you can Google that, the names of God, and you can see the list of them. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing to study. And uh, no doubt, maybe we'll do that sometime. But it's personal. So now we, we go from just Elohim, God, in a generic sense. I, I don't hate to use that because that word Elohim is used other times for just heavenly host. It's, it's, if you would, it's sort of a generic word that we do know it's specifically talking about the only one and true God. But in ever instances, like, like in the Psalms where he says, you are all gods. Remember when he was talking about judges, the judges who were to judge people in that civil society, they were actually called Elohims. <laughs> so the, the, that word, it, it's really not the word for God in the sense uh, of really making a clear enunciation to who he is, but Yahweh Elohim does. I am the God. And so now he's going to do things personally, if you would, more intimately. In other words, now we really are going to explain his image in this next creation, man. Now, all of creation, Romans says, gives us the image of God. If you look at nature, you have no excuse on the day of judgment. God will say, you should have known me. You should have sought me out. You should have cried out to me about your sinful condition. And I would have directed you from Elohim <laughs> to something more specific, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you didn't seek me. You, you knew I existed by creation and the elaborate, orderly way, the beautiful way it's made. You have to know there has to be a creator unless you deny it with a hard heart. And so um, Yah, this personal name of God, uh, the Tetragrammaton, um, the, the Jews, when they were, the Masoretes, when they were writing the Old Testament out for us or out for the Jews, 
when they came to this tetragrammaton, they would put their quill down. Their, you know, they had ink and a quill, a piece of feather. And they would go and they would worship. They would take a, all their clothes off, take a bath, put new clothes on, and then worship some more, and then write the consonants YH, VH, or, you know, in the Hebrew, though. Until they came to it again. And sometimes, like here, look at this. It would have taken a while for them to get through verse 4, 5, and 6, 7, right? They would have been taking a lot of baths, putting on a lot of new clothes. But that's exactly what they did each time. This is a very holy, sacred name. And it's not to be uttered. It's been to known, to be known, but not to be uttered. So it's a very powerful thing here. And so we, we learn that God is saying very specifically and wonderfully is he revealing himself in this end of the sixth day. In all of it, he made the heavens and the earth. In all of it, he did all of the, all that's in the fields and on the earth. And, but then the Lord God formed man. And he did it out of the dust of the ground. And then he breathed into that, and it became more than just a living soul. So as we go through Genesis, we're going to see where, where God actually says that, that animals have souls. And so I, I don't disagree with that. You see the soulishness of an animal, right? If you've ever had a dog, not a cat, forget that, but a dog. You can see the personality. You can see its love for you. You can see, I mean, it will sacrifice its life to protect you. It is a beautiful thing. But the spirit is something different altogether. And only man has spirit. And God specifically, uniquely made man alone in his image and as a living spirit. The word man is the word Adam. The word ground, matter of fact, right here, we, we have that same exact word ground. It is the word Adama. So Adam is sort of a play on the word calling him ground or dirt, if you would. So Adam, this dirt, um, was just dirt. There wasn't anything specifically about his dirt. It was about the spirit of God living in him that makes him so amazing. So what's it say in 1 Corinthians for us? It's not in these earthen vessels that we take glory, right? We're pressed hard on every side. <laughs> we're crushed. We're battered. But the glory is the Spirit of God who lives in that earthen vessel. Well, going on in verse 8, So the Lord God planted a garden east, eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree, every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So again, it seems like if we were to go back and look more at when God made the trees and the plants, we would have saw some of this stuff from the ground stuff, like we see Adam from the ground. Um, and uh, this garden, it's called Eden, uh, eastward in Eden, that is. And then he goes on to say that after he made all of these trees, there's two specific ones he wants to mention. We're going to talk about this a little more in a minute. First of all is the tree of life, which is in the midst or the center of the garden. And then there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's all we're told about him at this point. There's two specific trees that are important to this story and hold that note as we go on. Now, a river went out of Eden to the water, the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the thirst was Pishon. We have no knowledge of that river today. Uh, it is one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold that the land is good. Bedalam and Anak stone are there. So the first readers, maybe of Moses' time, still had knowledge of those rivers, or uh, to some degree, but 
Today we have no knowledge of which rivers those are. We'd go find that gold. Anyway, uh, the name of the second river is Gihon. We don't have knowledge of that river today. It's the one that goes around the whole land of Cush, which is Egypt. So that could be maybe the Nile River it's referring to. We don't know. Just pure speculation. The name of the third river in the New King James, we have um, Heda Kill, but in the Old King James, it says Tigris, the Tigris River. It's one that we do have knowledge of today. It is the one which goes down east of Assyria. That's correct. Mosul, Iraq today. The fourth river is the Euphrates. We know where that one is today. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So after the flood, the whole earth was changed drastically. But it appears that the Lord, for whatever reason, kept at least a few of the rivers that were knowledgeable during the writing when Moses was the writer of Genesis X, still had knowledge of these four rivers. That's why they're mentioned. Today, we have still, which is amazing, we still have the knowledge of these two rivers. You can look at it. It's in Iraq today. And if you look right between the Tigris and the Euphrates River, as it comes down, as they join together, as you go down south, it's right next to where Babylon was. It's right where the Ur of the Chaldees are, which is where Abraham was from. And when I took world history, they called that the cradle of civilization. Do you remember that? The cradle, the baby, that's where the, the cradle of civilization came from. I'm, I'm sure they do not say anything like that today. But it was just saying, passed down to us to say, hey, this is where mankind came from. And that was out of secular history. It was known of the cradle of civilization. And so if you would, Abraham was an Iraqi who was from the Garden of Eden, if you would, or nearby the Garden of Eden. The Tower of Babylon, we're going to see later, is built again, either right next to or in the Garden of Eden. During the tribulation period, the Antichrist is going to rebuild Babylon, and that's where he's going to have his economic kingdom from. So it seems as if it's all, all of mankind, the history of mankind is going to come back to that Garden of Eden again. But this time, Satan saying, I'm going to have my own creation. I, 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 you know, your creation, Jesus, is nothing compared to my creation and what he does out of that. So again, it's, it's an interesting place. Take a look at that on the map and you'll see all of those things there. It, but notice here that he does have man to be the tender of, of that garden. We, we see that the garden that he gave man to work in um, is not a punishment to him whatsoever, but it actually is to be a blessing to him. George, uh, excuse me, uh, Henry Morris writes in his commentary, it is noteworthy that even in a perfect world, God made it, that work was necessary for man's good. In Ecclesiastes 2.24, nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This I saw was the hand of God. Ecclesiastes 5.18 says, here is what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and so enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life which God gives him for this is his heritage. In Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. Now it's interesting that the man was to tend this garden and there's actually two specific words he uses there in verse 15. He says to tend and to keep. This word tend in the Hebrew is used 289 times. 
I counted three times. I'm sure that's correct. 227 times, it's translated servant. So we often think of him as a gardener, but actually he's just a servant. He's supposed to do a whole lot more than just garden, isn't he? He's supposed to be the servant, the garter, the, the gardener to his wife. I love that in Song of Solomon in chapter 4, verse 12. He says, a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. He was to be tending to his wife, wasn't he? Later tending to his kids. God said, you're to be tending over all the plant world, but also over all the animal world. He was to be the servant. I, I just love that picture. Adam with just the, the first man, he's just a servant to everything on this planet. Yes, he was the ruler of it, but who's the greatest in God's kingdom? <laughs> It's not those who lord it over, is it? It's to those who wash one another's feet. So Adam was the conqueror. He was the one who was, you know, over all the planet. God gave him to be over it. And the first thing God says, be the servant to it. And he was. The next thing it says, to keep it. That word is used 469 times in the Old Testament. And it's translated most of the time to keep, but most of the time it's in the noun form, to be a keeper or a guard or a protector or a watchman. You need to be a military person guarding and protecting. First thing that comes to mind would be his wife, which we learned he didn't do a very good job of that. But really, protecting all things from the evil one, the enemy, Satan. Adam was not just a gardener of plants or of everything, but of plants and animals, the wife, his children. Verse 16 and 17, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Freedom, freedom, freedom. But, except, one little footnote, The tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So I'm making you a free moral agent. What does that mean? I, I have to give man a complete choice, the complete sphere of choice. To love God or to hate God. To disobey God or to obey God. God gave him fool. He, didn't, he just didn't make him to say, you can obey God, you can really, really obey God, you can really, really, really obey God. There you go, you have free choice, right? That'd be like us pro programming a, a robot to tell us that it loves us, right? If we programmed a robot, I love you so much, oh, <laughs> that just touches my heart. It doesn't do anything, does it? So in the same way, God's, the man's worship to God would be a true worship because it comes completely from his own free will. Well, we'll talk more about that next week. Well, in verse 18 to 20, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So in this part of literature, it's sort of like God having a conversation, again, within the triunity, the trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, saying, okay, we've made man. We already said we're going to make man male and female. That was already stated before the female was made. But now it's as if God is, again, doing anthropomorphic things. In other words, he's speaking in such a way where we can relate and we can understand. So he's saying, he's thinking out loud to help us. Okay, you see why I didn't just make Adam and Eve? Because I'm making a point when I make Eve. I wonder how many other things he did that with all the stars. I made it like this, not this, because I made a point. I'm making a point. And, and a lot of those points we'll never even understand until we're with the Lord. 
But here he's making it in such a way that he makes a real point to Adam, but also to us today about this unique relationship of man and wife in marriage. And so he uses two words, uh, somebody who would come alongside and be a helper, the person made second, and he would be comparable or suitable. They, it's interesting that the word actually is sort of the opposite. We could actually translate that. We need to make one who's a helper, but opposite of him. Interesting, isn't it? By being opposite, he will be a helper and comparable to help him. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, if you're around people just like yourself, you don't really grow. But when you're around people that are different from you, they have an edge to you that causes you to think differently and act differently and wrestle with things differently. This is what he's saying here. So out of the ground, God formed every beast of the field. So here it is again. Uh, Maybe if we could get more uh, specific when we ask God from heaven that not only did he make Adam and Eve from the ground, but it appears that he made all the living beasts in the same way. Out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So probably not every single specific type of creature, but every general category of creatures. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, the birds of the air, and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. So he had to discover this. This is important on that sixth day of creation, that Adam, very naively, as we know, he's very innocent, he, he, he is, there, I just named these deers and, and there's, uh, there's two of them together, you know? I just named these two monkeys and, and they're together. And, you know, it's almost like a kindergartner in some ways. He's just so innocent. And then when he's done, he's like, uh, I don't have anybody. So in the midst of perfection, there was a lack. In the midst of perfection, there was loneliness. That's that's incredible to really think about it. That paradise was not paradise for Adam if there wasn't one comparable to himself. Boy, that could be a whole other study in and of itself. Well, in verse 21, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. There was a guy by the name of James Simpson. There's a great book called Men of God, Men of Science. There's several of them out, but you'll find in one of those books, you can Google it too. There is a Scottish chemist by the name of James Simpson. And he would go in and, you know, make all kinds of different antidotes and things to help people with their sickness. And one day he just saw the lost, lostness of Scotland, that they were just walking away from the Lord. And, 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 and he just said, forget it. He had saved up enough money to not have to work for two years. He said, I'm gonna just give myself full time, two years studying the word. After that, I'm just gonna live on the streets, preaching on the streets that people should come to know Christ because that's the true antidote, eternal life, not to make people better to go to hell. They don't, they're not as sick, but they're still going to hell. Well, he made it as far as Genesis chapter two here. <laughs> and when he read this, God said, James, it's my will when men are operated on, they wouldn't fill it. You can look it up today. James Simpson, father of anesthesiology. He came up with chloroform because of this verse. And he is known as father of anesthesiology to this day. So Adam was operated on, but before that he was put into a deep sleep. One of his ribs was cut out. An old proverb says, you know, God didn't take from his foot that he should rule over the woman. He didn't take from his head that the woman should rule over him. But from the side that they can be 
sharers, partners, equals in that way. And then the Lord God, it says, took the woman and brought her to the man. So let's just stop and picture this for a minute. Adam's like, man, I'm so sad right now. I'm in paradise and, and I'm sad. I'm lonely. There's nobody like me. This is, this is horrible. We've got this incredible creation and I'm sad. And God says, come on over here, Adam, and sit down. Here, just lay down. And he starts brushing his hair and he puts him into this deep sleep. He takes off his rib. And then he takes the woman and he sort of maybe hides her in the bushes a little bit. I don't know. But he goes over and he starts to stroke Adam's face and stroke his hair. Shh, Adam, Adam, wake up, wake up. He begins to sort of stir and eyes are looking around. He goes, hey, we miss one creature that you didn't name. You're kidding. And he sleepishly gets up and there the Lord signals to Eve to come out. And there as she comes towards him, the very first words recorded of man are those of poetry about his wife. The first recorded words of man in verse 23, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The, one, the name woman here is Isha. But here, instead of using the word Adam, the Hebrew word is out of man is Ish. It's a very generic term. It can actually, in the next, next uh, chapter, Ish is going to mean my husband. <laughs> but out of man. So Ish is man, Isha out of man. The one who comes out of the man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. And so they were unclothed. That would be a question that people would ask. Were they clothed? What did they wear? Nope, they weren't wearing anything. Perfect climate, and they were innocent as children, And um, it was just a beautiful scene there in the garden. And the story ends there until we go into next week. And Lord, we thank you tonight for your word and ask that it would go deep, deep into our hearts as we meditate on these things, that we would be equally touched by your glory of your thought process of how you do all things. In Jesus' name.